I want to move to other examples just before we run out of time, because some of these are really great, including Janice Raymond and, and Sandy Stone on, um, and, and this is applicable to the current day in discussions of TERFs. Um, and J.K. Rowling is the most obvious example, but it, this is a uh, very applicable for, for modern feminist discourse here. Um, tell us a little bit about those two uh, feminists and, and what, Honestly, it says about about modern day uh, feminist discourse around tr uh, trans women. Yeah, it was really important to me to show how that the logic of anti-trans feminists, you know, who argue that trans women are not women, is actually part of white feminism, even though it's less obvious <laughs> because we most often think of white feminism in terms of its racism, but there is a there is a uh, subliminal uh, racism in the position of, of TERS. And so I look at especially the role of the trans uh, musician and sound engineer and activist Sandy Stone, who was part of a really important uh, collective, uh, a lesbian recording artist collective that sold hundreds of thousands of records in the 1970s and 80s called Olivia Records. Um, and then Janice Raymond, who is uh, an academic and author of, of probably the most important turf book uh, called The Transsexual Empire, who um, was uh, supported uh, a campaign to run Sandy Stone, a trans woman, out of Olivia Records in the 70s. And so it was a successful campaign. And we, you know, we often talk about and recognize that anti-trans feminists are what we call biological essentialists, right? They say sex is real. You're born a sex. It's very tidy and clear and it can never change, right? Biology is destiny is, there, is that kind of logic, which flies in the face of research that shows that anything up to 2% of births are intersex to some degree, right? But it, it's an insistence that biology is extremely tidy and sex is always straightforward and set in stone. That, that, that I was absolutely sure that TERFs are biological essentialists, but TERFs are also experienced essentialists. And what I mean by that is that they say a trans woman can't be a woman also because she didn't have the experience of being a woman growing up. She didn't have the universal experience of menstruation or the universal experience of sexual harassment or any of the other elements of being in a female body. Um, the problem is that there is there is no such thing as that universal female experience, right? And this is one of the points that Audre Lorde has made over and over again in her lifetime, right? Like black women have five times the rate of many of breast cancer, of sexual assault and abuse, right? One of the things that Harriet Jacobs was was illuminates versus Harriet Beecher Stowe is that you know in the 1860s, what is the position of being a woman? If you're Harriet Jacobs, you might be hiding in an attic for seven years. If you're an enslaved black woman being abused by your enslaver, um, if you're a white woman, you might have a completely different set of experiences. But Turks ignore all that and say, no, there is just one way to be a woman. And trans women aren't that version, so they can't be women. Um, but that is reinscribing that universal woman. And the other piece of it is that they also often position men as um, oppressors. Right. And that women need to be protected from men. It's a very simplified view of power where men oppress and women are oppressed. And that's kind of the, the end of the story for understanding contemporary politics. Um, and that, again, is something that is a lot like white feminism, because we, if we look back to the Kambahi River Collective, you know, famous intersectional feminist group in the 1970s, they made it really clear back in the mid 70s. Often for us as black women, they said, black men are more of our allies than white women mm. because we're fighting more concerns than just sex. And that's the kind of dynamic that TERFs can't see. They only see sex and they put everything else secondary. And that's what white feminism is. Right. And then the, the, the point you make about biological essentialism, that is a step away from a white supremacist perspective, right? Where we are these static 
things and our environment or our skin color or the gender that we have been assigned at birth, that is natural. And anything unnatural is evil in and of itself. Um, and, and that is very much in keeping with these themes that you've been discussing today. I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, my specialty as a scholar is in 19th century race science and the, and the beginnings of a belief in uh, biological essentialism about sex. Uh, and it actually turns out that when people got really, really attached to the sex binary, it was as a result of race science. And um, that literally it was race scientists who said white people have evolved the sex binary and nobody else has. So you're absolutely right to draw that connection. And, and the other thing I want to point out is like the idea that there that a, a woman's experience um, that there is a universal woman's experience ignores, as you say, all the class and race components to it as well, but ignores the often very traumatic experience of growing up trans in a society that is immensely hostile to that where you that is a set of its own unique experiences and trauma and then someone like jk rowling has very publicly basically devalued that or said that it, that is separate and distinct when obviously there is no way to make that delineation um except if you're trying to reach a conclusion that is bigoted <laughs> absolutely right turfs are insistent that the largest victims of gender uh are women and the only victims, you know, but any kind of fight to be, toward like who is the biggest victim is not usually going to turn out very well. <laughs> That's not a very strong place from which to build a, a movement. Um, but that is one of the many turf errors. Absolutely. Absolutely. 